The world has been overwhelmed by an almost invisible enemy, a virus. We'll see how a microscopic villain is changing history as millions have died, fears are heightened and the risk of poverty increases. What will the post-Covid world look like? We ask three experts. Peter Frankopan, Professor of Global History, Karina Norsettina, Social Scientist at the University of Chicago, and Jean-Paul Fitoussi, Professor of Economics. Peter Frankopan, welcome to your news. As an expert in global history, do you think that COVID-19's ability to spread so fast and easily has been an absolute novelty in the history of the pandemics? No, I mean, we live in a world that uh, technology and uh, our travel connections allow things to move much faster. But pandemics is a very important part of global history going back many thousands of years. That the problem is when we live as human beings close to animals, the jump from the animal kingdom into things that become damaging and dangerous for human beings is, is part of the price we pay for the food supplies that we have. What was, what was unusual about this pandemic was the fact that after it was identified in Wuhan, uh, how quickly it spread across to Europe. But in fact, even those speed elements, one needs to look at differently. So we're here now more than one and a half years since the first identification, and it's only now starting to sweep through India in a devastating pattern. So these things, they do take time, but they tell us a lot about how we communicate, how we travel. But the speed is, is I think, uh, not, not as, as dramatic as we might think. Looking back in history and making comparison with the previous contagions, uh, how might this pandemic change the global political order? Well, I think that all depends to be seen on what happens next. I mean, before the pandemic happened, everybody realized that this was a time where China was rising very quickly in ways that were predictable, also unpredictable. Uh, Russia and its relationships with its neighbors, particularly Ukraine, were already extremely problematic. Uh, climate change and its impact on South Asia and the Middle East and West Africa are, are topics that a lot of people are thinking or worrying about. So we're living in a time of great change anyway. So in some ways, this, cat, this has acted a catalyst to slow some things down. The, for our air is cleaner, the birds are singing because we're not traveling so much. But the real longer term impact will be on the global poor. That is where the most pressure comes in these kinds of environments because rich countries are able to generate maximum debt that they need to, and they're able to convince investors that they'll pay them. But emerging markets and uh, countries that are undeveloped are, are already suffering terribly, and, and that gap will become much, much worse in, in the years coming forwards. Going back in history again, uh, did we see such uh, an economic uh, effect or financial effect by pandemics? Well, the difference with this pandemic is that although it's affected millions of people, actually its mortality rates are not so bad. It seems very dramatic as we see on the TV, but the Spanish flu, for example, 100 years ago, if it had killed now on the same level as 100 years ago, we'd be looking at more than 250 million people who died rather than 3 million. So each of those deaths is a personal tragedy for the family and avoidable, of course, if better measures have been put in place. But this one won't change labor relationships in the same way because there's no major demographic change as an impact. It's about how governments manage their debts and how we decide to re redo that relationship, I think, between political centers and citizens or taxpayers. And that, I think, is a really important discussion that's already going on, but will we'll accelerate in the next few years. Do you think that the post-COVID world will be less interdependent, so? I'm very anxious that the decoupling also has a dark side as well. So I, I think it's much harder than people seem to suggest that it is. Uh, there are clearly the geopolitical jigsaw pieces at the high level that need to be looked at. Uh, but no, I, I think that, you know, I hope that we go back to normal, because if we don't go back to normal, the, the bottom line means inflation and higher prices, and that will be devastating in the short term. Is the Russian vaccine a Sputnik a tool of power politics or a weapon against COVID our common enemy? So when we see the Russians offering their vaccine, we think this is a tool. And the first question would be, well, what is our parallel? Where, where are our vaccine um, uh, and, our, and our medical support for other parts of the world? Why don't we use our, our vaccines equally in the same so-called diplomatic way? So for sure, Russia and Moscow will be trying to use its, its leverage. As it happens, Russia has got much weaker position globally than I think most people think, but it has to use its abilities in diplomacy quite carefully. I think we in Europe, we, we are shut down to the idea of what we want. So in fact, we've even talked about restricting the shipment of vaccines from Europe to other parts of the world. And typically in our pharmaceutical industry, we prevent 
intellectual property being used to lower the price of medicines that would save lives in the developing world. So we, I think in Europe, we, we expect everybody to do things our way, but actually when we look at ourselves in the mirror, there's a lot I think that we should do better. As citizen of the world, are we now bound to give more importance to health system rules and medical research in regional groupings, as well as in the free trade agreements because of pandemics? Uh, it's a funny thing is, is that, that crisis often brings positive outcomes. And one of the things I think that the pandemic has taught us is that we need to have a much more integrated global response to, to disease and pandemics. The amount of research and the way in which uh, collaboration works between university research centers has been a real miracle during this process of seeing how quickly and how many vaccines have been developed. But the reality is, is that uh, only 3% of medical funding goes into antivirus research. And I think as a result of that, the way in which we think about how do we cooperate better to cure diseases in a more structured way is really important with things like cancer or with AIDS, et cetera. I think that there's some real hope that these collaborations can be replicated into other areas too. So that there, there, there will be some upsides about how do we work together. The problem is of course, politicians in all countries always mess things up because uh, they, they, they cause often problems that they don't need to be, or they, they are playing power games with each other. But as far as the medical side, a corporation goes, I think it's, it's you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be in a better position uh, when, once the pandemic comes to an end. Just the last question. Uh, the figures from this pandemic are tragic, as you said before, and awful. But compared to the Spanish flu and the plague of the 14th century, the effects of COVID seem to be less harmful for humanity. Are we more psychologically vulnerable than our ancestors? That, that I can't tell you. What, what I can tell you as a, as a global historian who looks at thousands of years is that human beings are very resilient and we're quite good at picking ourselves up at the end of devastating wars, uh, following genocide, uh, following tr huge tragedy. We're quite good at getting back on our feet and trying to learn some lessons. I think that, that that's not what worries me. The problem is, is when governments take on very serious amounts of debts. Uh, they can be incentivized to make erratic decisions uh, when they're unable to meet their obligations. You know, we all know that, that if you don't have enough food on your table or you've run out of money, that's when problems come. And I think that, that in the developed economies of the world, we are more resilient at the moment, but the worry will be there will be an escalation of confrontations between states who don't have the capacity to support. And it doesn't take much with bad weather events, with failed harvests. You know, we see a huge amount of dislocation in agricultural markets at the moment uh, from, from wine growing in France this year, the grape season, through to the price of cereals. And it doesn't take much for those to spin out of control. So resilience is not the key question. The question is, do human beings put the differences behind them and fight? Or do they find a way to work pacifically and support each other? And that one, I think the jury is out and we'll have to see. But as an optimist and a pragmatist, I think that we're quite good at, at getting past problems. Peter Frankopan, thank you very much. Pleasure. Our societies have endured months of isolation, loneliness and social barriers. Human beings have had to radically change their lives. Dr. Norzettina, welcome to Euronews. What kind of fundamental lessons do you think the world has learned from the pandemics? Well, one fundamental lesson certainly is that it is not just, it hasn't just been a biological problem or a, an epidemiological problem, but uh, it has caused huge disruptions in our social life, in what the social means for us, in what society means. It means that many of these light ties we have normally, we have normally in social life, these small gift exchanges. Like if I go to a bakery and I ask for a bun or something or a coffee, I get a smile, I get a service, I say thank you. Uh, and, and they are completely non-committal exchanges. They don't involve solidarity, going back there, any of that. And yet they produce a sort of social interaction uh, that's, that's like a medium in which we swim, and, and that medium was gone. Were you somehow surprised by the behavior of a society vis-a-vis -vis other people? Because all of a sudden there was a, a, a huge preoccupation by the society about the life of, uh, of elder people. They were not really abandoned. Yeah, I think that was a very positive, mostly really positive uh, part of the whole thing because 
it needed not be the case. You could adopt an attitude as some countries have in fact adopted that says you, okay, the, the fittest survives and the non-fit don't survive. And if all the people are more prone to, to the illness and can't survive it, uh, we will have to take, we will just have to swallow that. But most, most states and most societies did not do that. Uh, and uh, took care. You know, even if we have capitalism, it has a social component. Uh, we have rediscovered the importance of investing in the health sector, for instance. Will people now rediscover the importance of solidarity and put aside greed and extreme individualism? No, I don't think the last thing is going to work. But uh, the solidarity issue, that's a deep, a deep, deep question. Because one thing we discovered, I think, in the pandemic, uh, and I'm speaking mostly about the US because I've been stuck here for a year, uh, it, would, it would tend to refuse to wear masks, which is a very limited thing to ask people to do. It is not uh, really a deep problem to wear a mask. But they started a war of masks. And you found suddenly that uh, there is no we. We are not us. We are not one nation. We are completely divided along unexpected lines. Now, I am not saying that this division wasn't there before. But we didn't have to pay attention to it. From this point of view, do you think that the practice of social distancing is here to stay even once the pandemic is over? Not completely, no. Uh, on that level, I think we, we, we will completely recover. But uh, on that more political, uh, co completely collective level, you know, the uh, imagined community of us, of we, as a united people, that is going to be a problem for a longer period of time. And I see no evidence, for example, in the United States, that's getting better. Smart Working and Virtual Leaders Summit, the digital world came into our life faster than expected. Are we really facing long lasting and significant change to how we live our lives? Or we will just go back to normal once this is all over? Many corporations in the US are planning to and have already started to go back a little bit, half time, but uh, also get rid of their real estate, you know, and saying, well, people can work from home and they should work from home. Now, at universities where I work, we will go back, we will try to go back to normal because we know that students come to a, a, a American campus university uh, not just for reasons of learning, but also for reasons of the social networks they form there. They want that social contact and they don't want at that age, you know, to be on screen in the flatlands all the time. So we will probably have to go back and go back completely. There are market interests, but also kind of uh, relationship interest between uh employees and, uh, and the company, basically. The online life has to be scripted. It has to be initiated. You know, it's a, a, a procedure to perform it. It's not informally just happening lightly and easily. So it will be good if people do take advantage of the uh, uh, what can happen in in-person in situations. Thank you for being with us. Thank Thanks you. The pandemic has highlighted the global economic order's shortcomings. States have had to run to its rescue. Bonjour, professor. Hello, Fetusse. Professor Fetusse. Welcome to Euronews. One of your theories is the lamppost theory. It's a lamppost metaphor. We know that parts of society are lit up by the lampposts, but there are also unlit areas, dark zones. Has COVID or the pandemic shone light on these dark zones? It has shone light on the fact that European health systems are not in as good health as everyone thought. In regards to France, it came as a big surprise that the French medical system wasn't the best in the world, as they once thought. 
That's because we did not invest enough into the hospital system. We regulated the system and stretched it as much as possible to reduce spending. But in reality, we've made the system dysfunctional and replaced doctors with administrators. And what about the role of the state in all of this? The main mission of a state is to protect its own people. The COVID-19 crisis has reminded us of this in a very dramatic way. Every state has started protecting its people. There's not one single state that hasn't done that, even though before, protecting either the unemployed or the soon-to-be-employed or companies that were about to become bankrupt was considered an infringement of the mainstream mindset. We've rediscovered that in a global system, if we leave our borders wide open, and that's what globalization means, we have to protect our people more. Otherwise, we will be forced to do so due to a major crisis or a revolution. Professor Fitoussi, Professor Fitoussi, do you think that the recovery plan that was approved by the European Union as a response to the economic crisis generated by the pandemic will be enough to reshape the project of a social Europe? Well, there are two points in the recovery plan. First of all, it exists and it gives substance to the idea of a euro bond. That means a solidarity financing of Europe. Is it a big step forward then? It's something extremely positive. It's something extremely positive. Nevertheless, the recovery plan is not implemented because of endless debates. If we look at the United States, we see that they are going to spend almost 6 trillion euros, while the EU will spend just 750 billion euros. And the EU has more inhabitants than the United States. As far as we can see, we're not playing in the big leagues. Of course, with such an effort, the United States will recover quite fast and it will have a competitive advantage over Europe. And that advantage is bound to get bigger. Has COVID unveiled a severe lack of democracy and leadership in the European Union? The people are being scoffed at. They are being told, you are not real citizens, as you are not able to use your country's politics. But anyway, we'll pretend that you are citizens. They have lost their sovereignty, and the sovereignty that they are being deprived of is not actually being used on a European level. That's the problem of Europe. There is a void of sovereignty. There's no European sovereignty, and there's no national sovereignty anymore. So what do people do in these circumstances? Well, they look for a quick answer, and that quick answer is populism. Populism promises that everything is possible, even if it's unbelievable. People think, what have we got to lose? Politics aren't changing. We're still unemployed, we're getting poorer and poorer, and the middle class is vanishing. What do we have to lose? Let's give the populists a go. Professor Fitoussi, thank you.